Hi, I'm John Atak, and this is this is about the thirtieth time I think that that, that we've done this. Um, uh, goes back to what 2015, June 2015, where we first met. So um, we're very happy to welcome each other to one another's YouTube channels. The thing I love about talking with you is we get to go deep. We get to really talk about the, the essentials of what Dianetics Scientology over on Hubbard and, and Coercive Control are all about and how they sort of manifest through this crazy <laughs> subject called Scientology that we were both unfortunate enough to be part of for a while. So but, uh, uh, I think you were yeah. you were less fortunate than I was because I had a really cushy experience of it when um, their lead attorney Kendrick Moxon in a deposition said to me, "So were you brainwashed in Scientology?" I just said no. You know, wow. I, no, it, and I wasn't. But it, that doesn't mean they weren't trying. <laughs> well, Whereas exactly. What happened yeah. to you was just absolutely horrifying. You know, to me, it's I was 19. I left when I was 28. I was a public member. I was on the periphery. So, I, you know, I didn't have any sleep deprivation. Can you imagine that? Nine years in Scientology, no sleep deprivation. You had years of it. I did. I did. I had as many years as you were in and more, three times more of of uh quite a bit of brutal nonsense yeah it was pretty ridiculous uh between the the work and the you know sort of uh labor trafficking aspect of it if we're going to be honest uh the sleep deprivation the food deprivation the psychological torture i mean it was and then on top of all that physical abuse uh added to the mix so it's it's a it's a subject worth warning people away from uh, and discussing in some detail because there's a lot of lessons to be learned from our experiences in Scientology and what we've come to learn about it that we are putting this stuff out there so that y'all don't not only don't get involved in Scientology but don't make the same mistakes in any field or area <laughs> you know, that's kind of the point of all this so uh boy what a, what a head trip huh Scientology and, and Scientology is a, a microcosm of authoritarianism that yes. um, my dear friend, uh, Christian Shcherko, um, who is in, incredibly expert in this field and, yeah. and has, has helped somewhere over 3,000 people back to life after they've been involved with authoritarian abusive groups. But he used to hand out my... Um, he now gives people Opening Our Minds as the first book to read. But he used, oh, nice. to give, used to give them Scientology's Cult of Greed because he said it doesn't matter what group they've been in, they will recognize because Scientology does all of it. That's right. That's so, right. That's why it makes, I mean, from a, from a cult education and um, prevention point of view, from the, from the side of things we're on now, Scientology has got to be one of the best case studies there is because the levels of manipulation and control that exist in that organization are, are severe in nature. They are legion in number and they, and they're multi-layered. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on in Scientology versus something I, I always sort of throw this out as a as a as a juxtaposition is tm hmm. where tm is, is is not you know just one or two things but it's not a lot there's not a lot there it's yeah, really there two just... fundamental techniques in transcendental meditation yeah got two. the repeating the name of a demon or or deity which yep. is not a religious practice by the way and until you trip out that's yes. that's the one thing gansfeld effect and the other is is the hopping and uh, yes. I I did a great interview with Pat Ryan where he actually talks about what happens when you do the psychic hopping. And but that's it. Scientology, 2000 techniques, more than 2000. Exactly. They are, you know, at some point you and I need to go. Actually, there are only seven or eight techniques, really. But they've been, you know, so there's visualization, for example, there's so-called straight wire where you remember things. There's engram running. But there are actually only a few techniques, but they're then, you know, used in different ways so that you've got thousands of so-called processors. I always dislike that word process. You know, I don't want to be <laughs> processed. I don't want We're to be indoctrinated. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, 
But well, it's interesting because even with the language manipulation, you know, we talk about loaded language. Lifton talks about how you can take language and manipulate it so that you're changing definitions into new concepts that tailor thinking so it's directed toward how the cult leader wants you to be thinking. And there's the use of thought stopping cliches where you'll come up with words or phrases that will actually shut down a person's ability to think. Mm -hmm. label things or come up with these sort of, you know, you only live once kind of phrases that are just ridiculous that that stop people from thinking. But even there with that, you have these you have these these levels of things that are happening with language. But Scientology has nine different forms of just clearing up and understanding a, a, a body of text. They call it word clearing. And there's nine method different one, methods two, method of that, three. Yeah. right? Yeah, method one through nine. And then there is, um, then there's all the phraseology of, you know, uh, and technology surrounding dictionaries and encyclopedias and how you use them correctly. And I mean, there's a whole, there's, there's, that's what I mean by multi layers to this is it's not just, oh, words are important. Look them up in dictionaries. It doesn't stop there. It just keeps going. Yeah, and, and he, and he you know, two 600-page dictionaries, and yeah. there he is, you know, deriding complexity and pointing out that misunderstood words will lead to the commission of transgressions, sins, overts. Yep. Uh, so he is, you know, I, the, the first course I did, the communication course as it was, the first thing we looked at, and they did change the wording later, but was OTTR zero. So you're in off the street, and the first thing you're told, well, you've now got to look up what is an operating Phaeton. And that's right. It became beginners, TR zero. And um, by the way, that's an Alistair Crowley technique. That That's the person who first said, sit you with your eyes closed. You know, that's where Hubbard got it from anyway. He's probably not the first person who said it. Um, oh, how interesting. I was always wondering about that. Mm. And when we come to the loaded language, of course, the, the classic, and which I think everybody should read, Margaret Singer said the same, is George Orwell's appendix to 1984. I have been criticised by Andy Nolch for suggesting that um, 1984 is the worst written of George Orwell's books. I've read 11 of his books, so I feel qualified to judge. Andy's only read that one book, but he's like, it's a brilliant book. How dare he criticise? But it, it's badly written because it wasn't redrafted. It's the last thing he wrote. He was very ill. He was dying. And at the same time that he was writing it, he was grassing up his friends and informing on you know, people like Stephen Spender, telling uh, military intelligence that Spender was was gay, which, of course, was oh, a, a, bit of a criminal offence at the time. So but putting aside, you know, who our heroes are and why we shouldn't worship them, mm. the, that appendix where he talks about doublethink and making a language where you can't have, you can't commit a thought crime anymore. You can't right. even think the words for it. And Scientology is so much more elaborate than any other group. It's like this guy just couldn't stop. He just kept on. Worse yet, when you look to the definitions that he gives, there's, there are often contradictions between them. So you look up something simple like Q&A, which means one thing in the real world and a quite different thing, you know, like reasonable to Scientology. But then you'll find four or five different definitions of it. So finding out where you are in this morass, which is meant to be the white taped route that will take us all out to um, Nirvana or whatever the end phenomenon of Scientology really is, it, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to, to make sense of it. And I think that kind of information overload is an essential way that Scientology works because you have this idea, oh, he's so wise, he knows so much. I don't understand what he's talking about. When I achieve an elevated state, I will understand what he's talking about. Now, we achieved that elevated yeah. state, you and I, and I know what he was talking about now. I've understood precisely what he was talking about. And that is, there was um, an academic called Fritz Haack who wrote a book um, sadly only available in German, which I don't read, which is, um, I think it translates as Scientology 20th century magic. And what was published, I think, 70s, early 80s. I've got a copy of it. But I say, my, my wife reads German, but she's not very interested in Scientology for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
I think this was a very important point. We we went in some depth into Hubbard's involvement with the occult, and we got to the point where we were talking about, well, Scientology is a magic operation. It's a working. Yep. And it's a very difficult concept to grasp. But if we look at it, you know, Hubbard is performing a, a magical ritual, the purpose of which is for him to be deified, apotheosis. Mm -hmm. And in OT8, that's pretty straightforward. It was there in the R6 processors, the, the things that you did just before the clearing course, where you were looking for the source. And Hubbard is putting forward this idea that he is that source. So, oh dear, we're all in trouble if that's true. Um, who knows where the universe is going to go? Um, not not a good place, I don't think. Yeah. But he's yeah. putting forward Scientology, if we look at it from the other way around, is, yeah, absolutely. It's not 20th century Buddhism. It's 20th, 20th century magic. So or witchcraft, that's right. Yeah, or witchcraft. Or it, but the idea is that, you know, one of the, you load language by changing meanings and by rebranding. Yep. You know, so Standard Oil of California became Esso, became Exxon. And one of the reasons that they transformed was that before the First World War, they'd had 11 strikers murdered. Uh, that got them some bad press, even though Ivy Lee, the great PR man, was working for them, got them a bit of bad press. So they changed their name. We had a, a meltdown in our nuclear power plant, Windscale. And so it was renamed Sellafield. They still got a core burning there since I think 1958 or something. But you rebrand uh, Monsanto. They don't exist anymore. So we don't need to worry about genetic modification. I can't say I'm tremendously worried anyway. But right. Hubbard rebrands magic. So what were called spells before become postulates. And, and even processes. If and indoctrination, the upper level yeah. indoctrination. And in auditing, you don't have questions, you have commands. Right. So you're being told something here if you look at what these words actually mean, but he somehow manages to push you away from that. The aim of Scientology, well, as we both well know, is to be exterior with full perception and to be to have control and command over physical and mental matter, energy, space, and time. That's right. So that was where it was headed from about 1952 onwards, that you were going to be three feet back of your head. I'm not sure why that's, you know, it's like, would you drive a car from three feet behind the car? That doesn't sound like a good idea to me. Better to be at the, the steering wheel. But this was always put forward again and again, three feet back of your head. And, you know, putting aside that's actually a American grammar, we wouldn't say that here. We'd say behind. Um, and, you know, we'll forgive him that. Damn Yankee. Um, yeah. Hubbard did have some very interesting phrasing sometimes. <laughs> some of his pronunciations were a little hilarious. Processing. 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 Yes, yes. Um, he, he, would call, he would call them robots. He didn't call them robots. He called them ribbits. <laughs> And yeah, and he couldn't pronounce Garcia. He said it was Garcia. You know, he, he would just grossly mispronounce things, hilariously causing the entire world of Scientology to grossly mispronounce things because you have to emulate Hubbard. Yeah, smoke cigarettes and, and say things wrong. Um, That's right. Very odd. And so, so I mean, I mean the, the word Thetan, it, it took me so long. For the penny to drop on that word you know because of course we say theta not theta and he does comment on that in the lecture where he's saying that he wants british people to say theta not theta mm -hmm. and it the, the it really came together for me i, I saw a roman mosaic where the theta symbol is or theta symbol is used to indicate the spirit leaving the body yep you in uh, murals of gladiatorial combat you'll see these little theta symbols in the air. And that's the idea of somebody's just been killed and the spirit has left the body. So that was an interesting thing. But uh, then that, finally to go, hang on. I, 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 that's completely new to me. So thank you for, for sharing that with me because I've never heard that before. And that is enlightening. Yeah, he, he's, he 
grabs hold of something. He's got a copy of the Reader's Digest and he sees something in it and it becomes part of the technology, like his astonishing um, bulletin about penicillin, you know, where he suddenly, or, or him talking in the touch assist things about neuron synapses as if it had any relevance to, to him at, at all. But he's seen it and it sounds clever and he's going to put it in there. It doesn't mean he necessarily understands things. He doesn't seem to have done very well in that regard often no. you know, um as brown mckee said you know i'm a physicist and and so what 24 years or something in scientology i knew what he was saying about physics was nonsense but what he was saying about buddhism was fascinating and i read that in the clearwater hearing and went well i came from buddhism and i knew what he was saying about buddhism was nonsense but i was fascinated by what he's saying about physics yes exactly exactly but i would suggest that that you're being offered godlike magical powers in Scientology, which we all want to hear. You know, it's like you don't want to hear, oh, well, it's all very puritanically depressing and you're going to have a hard time. It's like, no, you're a god. You've just forgotten it. All you need is to get your powers back. We can do that. Just just pop a few hundred thousand dollars in our bank account for you, and we will convert that into the spiritual currency of enlightenment, and um, you will be outside of your body you'll be out of your head you'll be out of your mind it's not that we're lying to you we are telling you you will be out of your head and you will be out of your mind by the time you finish ontology um and you'll you'll have astral travel you know this usual crowleyite magical background you'll be able to travel to anywhere in the universe and destroy planets you know, just like the band Disaster Area in the Douglas Adams novels, be able to blow up planets because you're so loud. Um, and you will do this through the power of intention. And this is the, I think, after all these years, the core doctrine of Scientology, to to make it so you can intend anything to happen. Now, right. it doesn't seem to be working very well for Scientology because they intended to clear the planet by 1960, by 1970, by 1980. I remember Diana, Hub Diana Hubbard saying in there's an event trying to cover up the Guardian's office break-ins, 1981 it would have been. And um, she, there we are in London in this half full hall. And, and she's saying, we're going to have the planet clear by the end of the year. So- By the end of the year? Yeah, 81. We always <laughs> deliver what we promise. That's the policy of Scientology. We always deliver what we promise um they haven't managed to get anywhere closer to it by now and they're down to about twenty thousand members at most yeah so the the postulates the magic spells aren't really working and you know all of these elaborate procedures to to make it so you'll be able to intend things and if it worked, I, you and I wouldn't be here, let's face it, with 20,000 people not wanting us to be here. Yeah, exactly. Let me ask you a question real fast, because I'm uh, as I'm thinking about this, I've, off, I've, I've, I've a couple times heard people who are educated in or have heard something about or read about Thelema and the OTO and Aleister Crowley and, um, you know, the whole will and intent mm -hmm. thing and, and um uh, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, you know, but then there's this additional phrase about, love you know, it, love under will. Exactly. Right. And they'll point this out as apologia or justification for Crowley. They'll say, Hey, look, he wasn't, he wasn't saying that the world is your oyster and you can do whatever you want. You're supposed to be a good person. You're supposed to do good things. Love is supposed to guide your principles. And yet Hubbard didn't say that. And Hubbard didn't seem to manifest that idea. And I wondered what you thought of this, my take or response to that, you know, attempt to mar you know, minimalize or, or sort of, no, 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 Crowley didn't really mean that, is, well, I don't know what Crowley did or didn't really mean. I don't think Crowley even himself understood what he really meant sometimes. But I'm pretty sure that I understand what Hubbard thought about what Crowley was writing. And I think that we are describing exactly what Hubbard thought mm -hmm. is that Hubbard was all about manifesting intent or will uh, over the minds and hearts of other people. I mean, he wrote it in his own writings that he wanted men to be his slaves. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a lot of equivocation on what Hubbard thought about this, but what do you, what's your take? 
I, I mean, I, firstly, I think it, it, it's in, extremely important to make that um, juncture to, to say um, that, that the principle of the Church of Thelema of the Ordo Templi Orientis is do what thou will, should be the whole of the law. Mm -hmm. And um, to put that in context, the, the phrase actually comes from the 17th century novelist Rabelais. Um, mm. The Church of Thelema is is there in uh, Pantagruel, I think. One of the, I find him utterly and completely unreadable. Um, it's suggested that he smoked an awful amount of cannabis, which um, you know, might explain why he just rambles forever. <laughs> um, so he came up with this. I don't like, know anything about that. <laughs> and it, it, certainly, where where I think Rabelais is is coming from. It is calm down, calm down, Chris. It's all right. Uh, where Rabelais is, is coming from is this this point of what you want to do is what matters. The, this the little addition of the love is the law, you know, love under will. Uh, this idea, it, it it would very much depend what we meant by love, and if yes. that was self love. And the the belief that you were the beast six six six, which is what Crowley believed, and according to Elwyn Hubbard Jr., who did spend seven years working for his father, um, this was what yeah. You know, when Crowley died, Hubbard decided that he was now um, the beast that that he was going to bring the new eon, the new age to mankind, which which Crowley had, had talked about. Um, and we do have more than just Nibs saying that because we have that OT8 document that Hubbard ostensibly wrote, and I believe it was his writing. It certainly reads like Hubbard, where he flat out says, um, you know, admits to an, a Gnostic understanding of of certain Christian principles, and that uh, that he is Lucifer, the light bringer, the the guy who's going to bring enlightenment to everybody. But he is Lucifer. That's how he identifies, <laughs> and in most people's minds, that's the bad guy. You know, it's yeah. a twist on the whole on the whole narrative, and it, it get that gets into a whole other aspect of the Crowleyite teaching, which, which um, is still strong in, among the anthroposophists um, who don't really want to remember that Rudolf Steiner belonged to the group out of which the Ordo Templi Orientis came and studied ritual magic, and he puts forward the idea. I think you have Jehovah Araman. And Lucifer. So you have three deities who are doing various things with one another. And Hubbard undoubtedly was aware of that. It's interesting that he steers so clear. You know, of, you know, he makes the the comment about Crowley. You know, the, the Christians want his head because he's criticizing Jesus in one of the Philadelphia doctor, doctorate <laughs> courses lectures. But they're there ha he has to have understood more than he's sharing in terms of of what the Crowleyite magic was about. So there are it, it is said by some scholars that there, there are three paths within religion or spiritual belief that there is the devotional path where you worship and that is for the everyday people they, they just worship this thing. You have Amida Buddhism, um, which comes out as Nichiren Shosu and Soka Gakkai, um, Daiset Suzuki, the despicable man who was largely responsible for bringing Zen to the West, was actually himself not a Zen Buddhist. He was a Amida Buddhist. And, you know, so you devote, you worship, and you wait for nice things to happen. Krishna, The Krishna consciousness movement is totally a devotional what they call bhakti yoga, one of the eight forms of union or yoga with God, the yoke to God, is mm. the bhakti yoga, where you have prana yoga and asana yoga, the, the breath and the posture, which are the two that we think of as yoga, but there are eight in all. And bhakti yoga is one of them. And they, you know, they famously, you, you have the, um, oh, what's it called? The uh, juggernaut, this uh, great stone-wheeled, Thing that is wheeled out in Puri in India, and devotees throw themselves under the wheels to be crushed, so that they can enter a bliss state with with Krishna. Doesn't sound like a good idea to me. 
don't mm-hmm. try this at home. If you've got mm-hmm. a juggernaut at home, keep it in the shed. Um, it's not safe. And so that's one serious aspect of spiritual belief. The second is the mystical belief, which is the desire for truth through self-knowledge. And Buddhism is the queen of, or, or was, the queen of such practices. I have terrible doubts about contemporary Buddhism. I really do. Mm. Um, and that I think they've lost their way as to what they're meant to be doing. But mm. that idea is, as the Buddha said, um, you must escape the world as a man escapes a house burning down. Get out, enter Nirvana, throw away, you know, he called his son hindrance because he got in the way of him leaving. You know, you've got this idea, I will pursue the truth no matter what. And that's pursued through meditative practices, which we now know may affect the brain in certain ways that we ought to be a bit more cautious about. Um, But that's a path of itself. And that's the intellectual path. The third path is, and that's called the Dexter path, the right hand path, the path of knowledge. And that's a path of compassion and a path of giving, because you understand that you cannot achieve enlightenment without being good to people without caring about people. Then you have the left-hand path. It's called the sinister path. Sinister and dexter, left and right. And the sinister path is the exaltation of the self. Rather than self-knowledge and submission to the reality of God through devotion um, or, or entrance to nirvana, you have the elevation of the self to a position of power And people like Crowley believed that they were harnessing the the power of the gods, that they were subjecting the gods to their own will. So in that context, do what thou wilt, which will be the whole of the law, becomes quite nasty. When you study Crowley's life, and I'm afraid I had to, um, I've told told you about the conversation I had with John Simons, Crowley's literary executor. Uh he wrote the great beast which is the the first of the biographies and he was just this mad old eccentric bloke he was absolutely wonderful and uh, he said and the bastard the bastard he knew if he made me as literary executor i'd do this for him but i have and he knew how much i hate him (laughs) okay mate let's let's calm down but (laughs) when we get into crowley he had like this thing with a razor blade that that he'd walk around with a razor blade in his pocket and if at any time he violated a principle he would cut himself he would punish himself kind of aversion therapy this is early on in his spiritual path then of course he opened up to the the idea of taking any and every drug you can he was a heroin addict when he died um had a little bit of a problem along the way i think and that that it's one of the things that really started to concern me many many years ago in looking at hubbard was these people, the magicians, the people who are seeking power, they the will is to, it, it's almost, you know, it's a demand for purity in Lifton's sense, that you will do this and you will exalt yourself, you will make yourself powerful by committing acts that are considered immoral, that your power will increase the more disgusting things you can do. Now, we, we mentioned this in the last talk, and I'm sorry to bring it up again because it's the most disgusting thing. One of the things that Crowley says in one of his things is, a, is one of his little essays um, is that that he part of his ritual ceremony would be to find a woman who had gonorrhea and to drink the leucorrhea, the, the liquid that is produced. Uh, uh, we could have just said blood and sex magic and then left it at that. Ugh. Yeah, well, it, it just, I'm afraid it got a bit worse than that, but it's it so the doing the most, come back, get, come back into the present. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to do this to you every time we talk, man, having seen the effect it has on you. Come back to but, present time. <laughs> this, doing something disgusting, doing, so when I heard this story, which, which came from Andre Taboya, um, and which I don't have on record anywhere, that he'd walked in on Hubbard, I think in Morocco, but in North Africa, and Hubbard was sexually assaulting a 12-year-old boy. When I heard that, I kind of went, 
this is Crowleyite magic. This is find something that nobody will believe. When you become too incredible, you become invisible, to quote Ron Hubbard. Uh -huh. And do that. When I heard the the story, and, and it, it it is, you know, it, it, the case supervisor at Los Angeles at um, the advanced organization told me this story. And she had a, a woman who had freaked out because she'd given Ron Hubbard an auditing session and Hubbard was upset that Mary Sue had walked out of a session she was giving him. And you're not allowed to do that because the auditor's code says you've got to stay. In. And she was the auditor. Not that Hubbard ever let an auditor control a session. He'd tell them to stop and write things down. You know, David Mayo said he was always stopping him saying, write this down, you know, in the middle of a session. But he was upset about this. He had an ARC break, a break in his affinity, reality, communication, understanding. He was upset that, that Mary had walked out on him. And the reason she walked out was because he said he'd had sex with their daughter, Diana, when she was 14. Now, I, as I say, this that's how direct the story was. I got it from the case supervisor who was looking after this poor woman who was saying, oh, this, this, Ron said this to me in this session. I initially didn't name Diana when I heard it. I said one of his children, but then somebody else who actually heard it from another route, I think, um, put, you know, made it public. So you're know, talking about trauma bonding and why Diana might, why it might be that the only one of Ron Hubbard's children is who's still involved with Scientology is Diana. This might have something to do with it. Who knows? Well, this is, see, these are two pieces of information I've not had before personally. Yeah. Because they're not documented. This is rumor. These are rumors, right? But they no, they're are... not rumors. They're reports. Okay, uh, fair enough. Well, yeah, a rumor would be something. Total stories it, it, of secondhand it, it, knowledge, I, it, I guess I would say, right? But, but the same would be true of any witness report in a court. It's if, not. No, fair enough. Fair enough. I, you know, I, I get it. I'm just, I'm, I'm not throwing us, I'm not casting aspersions at it. I'm readjusting my thinking right now going, holy shit, this is interesting because I've adopted a sort of asexual position for Hubbard from the 19 mid sixties forward. And this, this forces me to change that view. So I'm, I'm just thinking out loud right now. Like, wow, that's, yeah. that's something to chew on, you know? And in, in, in you know, in fact, the, he could have been trying, you know, with the, the boy in North Africa, and we're taught this would be around about 1970. He may have been trying to regain sexual potency because he does appear to have um, lost his virility at some yeah. point around the time the seal comes along. That's right. Before that, John McMaster's talking about traveling the world and finding little red haired babies wherever he goes. And that he reckoned that Hubbard was tremendously promiscuous, actually, which is what. His son Nibs said about the 1950s. Right. And then we have this, this change. And he right. he's talking about sublimating sex into creativity. This seems to be a, a theme that he comes back to. And yet the idea, this may be personal. This may be that he's trying to regain this. But also to gain magical power, you have to be able to, you know, use your will. You have to be able to do things that, that will separate you off from mere mortals like thee and me and, right. and, and give you superpower, you know, which of course you can buy for, I think it's $35,000 now if you need it in Scientology. Yeah. Learn how to make things squeaky and oily. And <laughs> how oh, interesting yeah. that Hubbard was, would be doing that. I mean, disgusting, horrible, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not like, oh, wow, this is so interesting. It's just, but in a way, this is so interesting. Like, wow. he, Because I was, I, I was also, I mean, I, like Hubbard's, Hubbard's developing Scientology and doing all of this stuff. And it's a con and it's a this and it's a that. And yet at the same time, he's also working desperately to fix himself and come up with a system where he can manifest his will and intent. And and I was and I've been under the impression that he developed solo auditing with the idea that it was something that actually did something for him. Hmm. What's your take on that? Oh, I think that's true. I, I, I you know, with um, say OT three, mm -hmm. I think, and I, and I think it it's difficult, isn't it? That we all have moods. Uh, we all 
you know, change our mind. You know, there can be a day where you're feeling, I, I mean, creative people, it's the way you live. You know, you've written something and you think it's the best thing in the world. And then you look at it the next day and go, <laughs> and you can come back to it months later and think it's good. And it's very difficult to, to have a perspective. And Hubbard very much had that sort of temperament where he, it, it was in a manic depressive temperament though, that, that when he'd, you know, uh, it's Alfie Hart's comment about Hubbard should label it with the date. This is it, June 1950. This is it, August 1950. No, no, this is it. And you find him saying this repeatedly, you know, from Dianetics, where it's what, 273 cases have been completed. That's what he's saying in the book. And you're going, well, who the hell are they? Because, right. you know, the, the only people we know are Sarah, his wife, um, who says he was torturing her, um, Dr. Joe Winter and Don Rogers. And, you know, we might extend that to John Campbell Jr., and John Campbell, yeah, because he said he got cured of, uh, what was it, a headache? Uh, I think he had allergies. It was asthma and allergies. And he later, in 1951, he publicly withdrew and said, I don't believe this. Um, <laughs> Art Sepos, of course, who published Dianetics in October 50, had, had withdrawn it from publication as fraudulent. Well, all of them within a year had 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 pulled their endorsement you could say or were no longer involved with hubbard or scientology or dynamics didn't want to have anything to do with it ever again yeah. every person who who enabled that that book to be published was out of there within a year but there's one exception don rogers don uh, rogers okay was okay. on his um as an appendix uh mind schematic or something that used to be in dynetics i don't i think right. Gavage took it out it was in there for a long time and yeah. don um was with Joe Winter and Sarah and Hubbard um, in Bayhead, New Jersey. Oh, was he? Okay, I thought he had come along uh, after the fact of that. So, no. my bad, no uh, worries. And indeed, the, the let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. That's what Hubbard said to Don Rogers in April '50 when they opened the doors to the first foundation, and and he was talking about memberships. He was like the the patron meritorious and all of this stuff they finally got to. You give us this much money and we'll give you this title. Yeah. <laughs> You'll yeah. be Lord Thornfulroy. You know? right. They make so much money on that right now. So much money. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so, so but just, just, to, just to finish the thing on Don Rogers, Don left, oh, in, yeah. Don left in 1954. He was on the board of every foundation until then. And he was not upset with Hubbard. When I got in touch with him in 1984 and, the, the letters he said to me, which are absolutely revelatory, you know, um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, Tony Ortega's put them up at the bunker. Uh. And, uh, you know, Don had very carefully initialed them saying not to be published, not to be published, not to be published. And I had about 15 typed pages where, for example, he says when Sepos came along you know, from Hermitage House, a medical publisher, and said, yeah, great, I'll publish this book. Um, that Hubbard turned to Don Rogers and said, oh, we'll have to find a new technique because deep trans hypnosis isn't very popular. And you got, that was, there was that too. no okay. research. There was nothing. So, but then, of course, a year after in Science of Survival, he cancels Dianetics because it's hypnotic. Very straightforward. You will see the fluttering of the eyelids and it all comes back in 77. He's cancelled it because, so this is it, May 1950. This is it, June 1951. Right. And it just keeps on going. And I think he was desperately trying to, I think he may even have had some kind of moral thing going on. I've, I've often reflected that his grandfather, Leif Waterbury, because he grew up with his father pretty much absent in a house full of women. And and this patriarch, Leif, Leif Waterbury, was a veterinary surgeon. Um, he kept a few horses. But... I think that this man absolutely adored little Ron Hubbard and that he gave him this impossible goal by, by you know, perhaps adulating him and saying, you know, you're going to be a great man. You're going to. And I think Hubbard always fell short of that and blamed himself. And that's one of his modes of being where he's highly self-hostile. The thing with Serge Fouth 
at the end of his life where he asks Spouth to build an e-meter that will kill him, just plug yourself into the mains, mate. You don't need that um, e-meter to kill you. It's just silliness. Um, and then says, I fail completely. You know, it, it's all a waste, which, which OT8 also seems to be saying, as far as I can tell. So now you've got to audit it all off. All the junk I put into your head has to go. Um, so I think he, I think there's some kind of conscience going on in there. There's, but he wants to heal himself and he thinks he has, as with all faith healings, it lasts about three days. Well, that's where it got me thinking about this, um, these sexual activities. I want to, I want to circle back to that for a second, because if those things are true, do you think those are, would an explanation for that be that Hubbard in his desperation of perhaps, uh, you know, some kind of psychotic episode or depressive episode that he would fall back to pre-Dianetic Scientology techniques of the occult and blood sex magic. And okay, well, if the intent, if, if, if manifesting your will means you have to go do some magical spell or process that is truly, you know, moral breaking or rule breaking or outrageous, uh, then of course, you know, pedophilia would certainly fit that bill immediately and at once. And um, incest. You know? And incest, exactly, which is just absolutely horrifying, horrifying. I never imagined that Diana had experienced anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm still kind of reeling a little bit from these ideas, but I'm I'm thinking to myself, well, if Hubbard was gonna go do something like that, would it have been for the purpose of as you suggest, magical in intonation, mag magical invocation, mm -hmm. so as to, you know, solve some problem or deal with some issue he felt he was having at that time I and mean, you know mid 60s st hill c or c org time i mean there the massive amounts of tumultuous nonsense going on in scientology during that time and hubbard's paranoia riling up year by year by year becoming worse and worse and worse as time went on absolutely i mean from the victoria inquiry in 1963 in australia he okay. is getting more paranoid um right. he, he wants to it, it, there's always this thing of creating his own fiefdom. You know, I think it was Malawi. They tried to buy a piece of Malawi, and um, they right, could South Africa. And he gives this order that the currency of Malawi must be destroyed. And Mary Sue is is given this task to ruin this country. Um, I think they're doing reasonably well there. Actually, they're doing better than South Africa. That's for sure. Mm. Um, but. Yeah, the, the the urge to power and magical control over others, um, which bursts through every now and then. You have the thing where he was, the SEAL crew were being um, checked to see if they were soldiers of light or soldiers of darkness. There's this, it's about around about 1970. And what happens is that those who report as soldiers of darkness, and this is the old Gnostic idea that there's a, a war, a Manichaean war going on between two forces in the universe. And those who were soldiers of darkness, according to their report, were promoted. People like Alex Sabursky were promoted at this point in the early 70s. Those who appeared as soldiers of light, and this would probably be somebody like Hannah Whitfield, Hannah Eltringham, they are pushed down. And that's a kind of a weird idea, but it, uh, you know, I, I, for me, Scientology is kind of boy's own version of magic. It is not intellectually deep; it's simplistic. Um, I think John Orsley, when he left, said um, Scientology is spiritual kindergarten. And I, I would agree with that because Hubbard tended to be as 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 long-winded and dogmatic as he tended to be he was a fairly simplistic thinker mm -hmm. he wasn't a deep thinker and he didn't read deeply of deep materials he he castigated those materials he made fun of them ridiculed them constantly if can't couldn't and adler addled communication then i guess we've got to sort it all out and he was very much always approaching it from the point of view that truth is simple. He would say this, you know, truth is simple. It's uncomplicated. If somebody's complicating it for you, then they're trying to obscure it and control you. 
and of course that's what he was always up to yep. but it, but but he was never he was never a deep thinker the, the the concepts when he does go deep it's confusing it's bizarre like the axioms or the um or the factors or these you know some of the codes of scientology where he, okay, where exactly. he makes an apparency of going deep but it's not deep you start tearing it apart and there's no there there you know there's nothing really at the bottom of it until you get to the axioms and you realize that it all comes down to axiom one and axiom one is an article of faith mm -hmm. and you have to believe. And if you don't believe that that is true, none of Scientology makes any damn sense. I, I, uh, I knew Eileen Griswold, uh, she and her husband, Bert were members of the St. Hill um, OT group mm -hmm. and they would meet and have conversations. And she told me about the time they'd spent going through the axioms and uh, the Scientology axioms, not the impossible, truly impossible Dianetic axioms. <laughs> and she said, we just got to the point where we gave up. We didn't understand what, what it meant. And I remember sitting down with a, a young Irish woman. Um, I can't remember, I can't, it's so long ago, I can't remember her name. I remember she was quite delightful. And um, I said, um, yeah, the axioms, it, it's, it's just nonsense. And she said, oh, pull, pull, pull. she explored it. I mean, how, how could you say that? I said, well, axiom four, space is a viewpoint of dimension. Mm -hmm. And she spent two hours trying to explain that to me. And at the end of two hours, she went, you're right, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> space is a viewpoint of dimension. And he was boasting... Yeah, I think it's in the Phoenix lectures that he was the first person to define space outside of the use of matter and energy. And you go, space is a space of spaciness. It's not really told me anything. You know? Exactly. It's, it's basically a definition that, as I understand it, says, if you're looking at it, this, yeah, could, this could take a couple of hours if we could. <laughs> well, we don't have to go down this rabbit hole. I'm just saying. Oh, this let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> of the statement is if you're looking at it as space. I mean, it's like, what? And that's what, anyway, it's just, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It has dimensions. It's dimensional. It, it's exactly. like the, you know, the basic yeah. law of, of existence is exist. It's like, yeah. Well, I, well, exactly. I mean, oh. it's, and, you know, and, and actually it's so funny you say that because Hubbard, one time i remember in a lecture um commented on the fact that native american statements of wisdom were often that kind of thing you know the way you catch a fish is you catch a fish the way you I fish you know, chase a buffalo is you chase it you know i mean it's like these very obvious you know captain obvious kind of statements and hubbard hubbard loved that stuff let me let me ask you something while i'm still while i'm still thinking about it because i want to i want to back up just a minute and sort of maybe merge some of these ideas we've been talking about because been going in some different directions and you mentioned the three different ways that people manifest what spiritual belief or ideas the 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 the, the devotional the, the pursuit of the spiritual yeah yeah okay so we have devotional we have knowledge the, the second one we have devotional we have mysticism and, and we have magic the sinister magic. And it seemed to me that Hubbard was mixed I wanted to ask you about this because it seems that um Gnostic faith which is based on knowledge gnostic gnosis knowing um hubbard seemed to be taking a number of pages from that philosophy or that that road but but not in a really straightforward way and not in an easily understandable way it was always a little covert but this idea that knowledge will set you free is certainly a fundamental principle of scientology mm. yeah though of course it's rather like the knowledge that the Gnostics had, but when we go back and look at the Gnostic sects, and believe me, I have, yeah, the, the, you have the electoi, this idea of some of us are better than hoi polloi. You know, we're we're sort of wrong. We're the we're the people who know. Yeah, uh, yeah. The and and they are treated in that way. With the, you know, there are many different Gnostic sects, but um, the fundamental idea that comes back again and again is that the the gnosis, the knowledge is not something you will gain through observation and experiment. It's not scientific in its basis. It is much more like transcendental meditation. It's knowing the seven passwords that will get you through the seven gates of the planets, which will lead you to heaven. So, it, I, I mean, 
and to compound this issue, Scientology, socio some sociologists have, have talked about it being neo-Gnostic simply because it has levels of initiation as the Freemasons, right. the Crucians, they're all neo-Gnostic with the idea oh. that you are learning something at each stage, um, which again gets confusing because mysticism, the word, comes from the mysties um, in about 1800 BC, the Eleusinian mysteries which seems to, and when Christ comes along, you've got the Mithraean mysteries of the big thing throughout the Roman Empire, where you go and are initiated. You are given a great truth by a wise person. And so, you know, what, you know, that idea of mysticism, and these, originally these people are called the mysties, it's where the word mysticism and mystic comes from, that, and they all seem to go to the same place. And this is not relevant to our discussion, but it fascinates me. It might be relevant, actually. Um, and that is what's called the grave of fire by those Freemasons who admit that such a thing it, it doesn't exist. Um, and the idea is that you ultimately, after going through all sorts of initiations, being told all sorts of things and coming to believe all sorts of things, the final process will be you will be blindfolded You'll be, you know, there'll be things like bull roarers to frighten you, good for all 13-year-olds, um, scary noises, you know, it's like the ghost train or what have you. And you'll be taken to a very dark place and put in a coffin and the lid will be put on. This is being used as therapy in uh, South Korea, by the way, in your lunch break um, <laughs> at the office, you can go and lie in a coffin. And people I are giving... That. I saw that. But people are giving amazing that. testimonials. It's so life changing to be in oh a my dark God. box. You know, yes. No. No. Claustrophobia. No. Ed Edgar Allan Poe's greatest fear being buried alive. You know. Yeah, mine too, actually. No. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with that. Period. End of story. Yeah. No. But do you know um, Bob Newhart, the amazing American? Oh star? yeah. Oh yeah. I've. So I've Talked about that, yes. <laughs> his therapy thing where, where, yeah. Stop it! Stop it! Stop I'm it! I'm trying to be murdered yeah. alive. Stop it! You've got three minutes left. Exactly. Well, it's, what are you going to yeah. do? I'm going to bury you alive. Oh, okay. I love that guy. He's so funny. It's awful. Well, okay, so. So it seems that, see, I, I am quite positive that L. Ron Hubbard, if he were here, would not be able to explain even half of what you just said no. in terms of his own personal knowledge of the history of Gnosticism and mysticism and, and where these schools came from. I think he sloppily just kind of took ideas that sort of aligned with his view of the world or what he wanted, what he wanted to do and what he wanted was to manifest his will. And he thought these were going to be tools that were going to accomplish that. I mean, that's kind of how I've always yeah. thought about these subjects when I've been looking into them is, well, what was Hubbard doing with these? He was trying to glean from them. How do I use these techniques or methods to amass personal power and influence? Is that, I mean, does that sound like how you see it? Yeah, absolutely. And he will keep elaborating upon an idea ad nauseum once he's got an idea fixed in his head with no you know proof that it's real or otherwise he'll keep going um we won't get into any, any depth here because i know you're working hard on the, the tone scale at the moment and i'm glad okay. somebody is so i don't have to but he <laughs> starts out with that and he you know it's garland and the medieval humors the the four different types of being the the bloody people the sanguine cheerful people the snotty people who have the phlegm, the apathetic people, the two forms of bile, uh, melancholia, black bile. That's what it means. Um, the, they're the depressive ones because they're, they're, they've got too much black bile in their um, lower intestine, their small intestine. And then you've got the choleric or angry people because they've got too much yellow bile. And you start with that and it becomes elaborate. And it becomes elaborate, to the, you know, that there is so much and we won't get into it, but he actually starts misidentifying things and saying they're emotions. So he says pain is an emotion. No, it isn't. Right. He says making amends is an emotion. No, it isn't. And then when he's he keeps elaborating, 
So we then get the, oh, well, everybody in this world who's not a Scientologist is below death, dead in the head, raw meat wogs according to Hubbard. And the word wog is, is an N-word for anybody in Britain, by the way. It's not a word we use. Um, long since gone. But right. he liked it. Um, and he, you're dead in the head. So you so now he's got to have this other thing where we have regret has become an emotion. Blame has become an emotion. You know, and right. hiding at minus eight has become an emotion. And of course... It's worth pointing out that Hubbard spent most of his last years in hiding, which is minus. Yes, he eight. did. Um, That's right. Well, it was it was very interesting to see how during and for years after coming up with this whole tone scale, this emotional, let's assign number values to emotions and let's put it on a scale and start judging people using this how quickly he went to exactly your point of everybody is actually so bad off that they don't even know how bad off they are. They can't even know how bad off they are. And that is in and of itself, if you can convince somebody of that, you own that person. Yeah. You and know. it's always the thing, isn't it? With, with you know, destructive therapy systems destructive religions and there's a lot of it about this idea of the enemy within which yes. i've gone on about a lot that, that your unconscious mind is an agent that's working against you which is the freudian idea no it isn't there are unconscious processes there are things going on there isn't somebody in there there isn't a little devil in there directing this stuff against you so there isn't a reactive mind that, that has agency. And it's an amusing idea, but I think that's the problem. You know, our friend Yuval has this great thing that it's a good story, that um, it's not true and there's no evidence to support it, but it sounds cogent. And Hubbard was great at stories. And yeah. so, you know, talking with, with Mike Rinder a few months ago and, and um, bless him, what a lovely man. And... Uh, yeah, he spent so much time alone with Hubbard. And Hubbard would tell him yet another story about the atomic-powered cars and the dull bodies and the racing. And it's like, so we've spent actually the last one and a quarter quadrillion years, and that's about all we've done, it would appear, racing atomic-powered cars in dull bodies. You know, it's like it's very boring, sort of, you know, very narrow view of the world. Um, yeah. And he then shoved everything into it and you you go hang on a minute this guy he's ill most of the time he has terror stomach he has he reckoned he got ulcers which are he, he smokes 100 cigarettes a day he drinks according to demille a bottle of rum every night every and according night. to barbara cloden a bottle of scotch every night when he was in la and he you know, he's you know covering himself in bed for three or four days together according to barbara Barbara Snader, Barbara Cloden, whatever, whichever her names we, we go by, because he can't think of anything else. He, he can't. And then, of course, Alistair Crowley comes to his rescue and we get Scientology and so-called creative processing, which comes straight out of Crowley's ideas. Now, tell the audience, because we've mentioned this, we've dropped that quite a few times, and we've never talked about creative processing. And since it's come up here and we're talking about magic and Palema and Crowley and this kind of stuff, let's go ahead and talk about this for a second. Yeah. What is creative processing and why and how is it that it's coming straight out of Crowley? Well, it's visualization. It's it's what he's commonly referred to now as visualization, where where you make an imaginary construction of something so so that it will come into being. Mm. Um it, and if I remember right from the materials, it also includes unmaking things by imagining them. Yes, absolutely. Creating and destroying through the, the process of imagination. And we get into a little bit of a a bind here that um you know, if you talk to our, our friend Steve Hassan, mm -hmm. you know, he is a hypnotherapist, um, very highly trained in Ericksonian hypnosis, and he believes that it's good to visualize things before you do them. And I think that's sensible 
he talks particularly about sports people. You know, you, you're playing basketball, you visualize putting the ball through the hoop. And I can see that that would be useful. However, when we get to um, visualizing, you know, the Lord buying us a Mercedes Benz or, you know, the prosperity Christianity or Nichiren Shosu, you know, praying to a Gohonzon scroll so that you'll be gifted things or the law of attraction and the kind of, have right. you seen this beyond the secret that we've now got going around? I, I, this, I, I, I digress, but it's such an incredible thing that the people who made all of that money from the secret 15 years ago or something got Oprah Winfrey promoting it for them. And the idea is you've got to wish properly and then you'll get stuff because the law, you know, the, the universe wants you know, to magnetically attract things. And it's like, and you look at these ancient withered people now, 15 years later, and um, kind of go, well, why aren't you 21 years old again? then? if you've got this magical power, why are you aging so horribly? And they're going, oh, this is brand new. Nobody's ever done this before. We're the first... And right now, I think it's on Amazon Prime, you can watch Napoleon Hill. You can watch the third, and I, you know, I've only managed to watch one. You can watch all 13 episodes of the Napoleon Hill show from 1953, I think it is, where he says exactly what they're trying to sell you in The Secret. Exactly. A so. perfect demonstration of what we're talking about, by the way, in terms of the cyclic aspect of the stuff. It just... Mm -hmm. It just generationally keeps coming around and bringing in the gullible or the ignorant or the innocent or the people who just just never heard of it before. And they think it's brand new and they think it's so amazing and nobody's ever done this before. And I'm telling you, when it comes to these brands of worship, mysticism, you know, uh, occultism, that there is so little that is new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> on this yes. people have been kicking this stuff around for thousands of years but we are told that recycling is a good idea aren't we <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah it's unbelievable i mean with the whole you know postulate you know wishing hoping praying dreaming idea that hubbard puts forward um i i sort of trace back idea i've had a long time to do this I had nearly 40 years to do this and you go back and of course you've got Christian science where yeah. and Mark Twain's wonderful essay about, you know, breaking 234 bones or, you know, having two and, and having, and he's waiting for a doctor. He's fallen in the, the Swiss Alps and the doctor who comes along is a Christian scientist and who, who tells him, no, you, it's because you're not thinking right. <laughs> it's like, you know, okay. Um, but Mary Baker G. Eddy, Hubbard actually has a go at her, you know, mm -hmm. and then he adopts this essential principle that everything that happens to you is because you wished it to be so. That's and right. all you have to do is, you know, get hold of, of your thinking and the whole universe, you know, just as the sun stood still for Joshua, the whole universe will align to make sure you get your bag of M&Ms or whatever it is you've postulated um it all come into line it just gets but that uh, she got it from um phineas quimby um and you have the new thought movement and before oh. that you've got a guy called ralph waldo trine you thought i was going to go somewhere else with that name didn't you mm -hmm. ralph waldo trine who founded emerson lake and palmer of course much later on he wrote a book called in tune with the infinite in i think I think I've got a copy of it somewhere. It, way back in the 19th century, this whole idea of, you know, we are now going to um, be able to control all the things around us. Where is it gone? Yeah, so you can get it on Amazon right now. Yeah, well, I've got, I think it must it's be in the, the back of books down there. But the, the point is exactly as you say, if you keep digging back, then there is very little evolution taking place. We grab hold of rather simplistic ideas and what's moved against that is the notion of scientific investigation that's right which i would have uh, possibly has its beginnings with the buddha and then we have of course aristotle pushes it into a whole new place um and 
believes in spontaneous generation, you know, that bugs come out of mold and what have you, but never mind. He's nonetheless saying, how about we have a method? How about we collect evidence and have experiments and observation? That finally breaks through into Europe through Dun Scotus and Roger Bacon, who've been studying with Muslims. I know I'm going to get less of a complaint about that. Because the, the translation movement Nothing from the 8th century... Ever came out of the Middle East, John. Hush your mouth. Yeah. The translation movement in Baghdad from the 8th century onwards and the Abbasid Caliphate has gone, we will gather all the knowledge of the world. And so they, optics and you know, uh, surgery and quarantine and so, uh, algebra and alcohol, so much comes out of, of this incredible uh, renaissance of, of thought. They, they, right. Indian mathematics comes in, in through that. The idea of the zero, possibly the most important idea in science, you know, that you can have a nothing as well as having a something. You, you try multiplying using Roman numerals you know x11 multiplied by lv1 <laughs> you need numbers um but that right. comes into the west and that notion which people get so confused about they think that science is a belief system rather than a method and exactly. that method is the thing that that can and often does save us um and was meant to be at the heart of scientology in fact and and it was it was a matter of some shock to me. I remember interviewing David Mayo um, at some length in '86, and him describing the research for what would become OT five. And I'm kind of you know Hubbard. You remember Hubbard had said that pretty much Mayo had saved his life, and because he'd had his usual winter bronchial thing. You know, the clearing course came out of the one in '65, OT three out of the one in '66. You smoke a hundred cigarettes a day, it might affect your bronchia, but you can believe it's the wall of fire instead and Xenu and all of that. And it, next year he gets it again. In 77, when he got it, David Mayo sat and looked after him. And in describing the research for OT5, which would be rolled out for all of us at great expense, new era Dianetics for operating Thetans, David was, well, actually what happened was that I put to him the notion of misownership of ideas. That's what cured him. That's what changed things, that you have taken somebody else's idea as your own and you could relate that to body thetans. So right. body thetan had an idea and you're misowning it. You're believing it's your idea and that's what's making it stick because you have to put a lie into something for it to persist, the isness theory of Elrin Hubbard, which is weird. What's the lie that makes Scientology persist? That it works. Um, <laughs> so David said, basically, and I was able to examine the OT5 pack by this time, I'd seen it, and I'd seen the original and the corrected one. And the idea that you know, when I left in 83, we, we were called bad boys. It's actually in the technical dictionary. Um, or the, the admin it's in one of the dictionaries, and Hubbard says these are people who've achieved their powers through Scientology, but something's gone wrong ethically. And there was the idea that David Mayo had been involved with this material. And there are six, I think there are 58 bulletins in the full pack. Six of them had to be changed because they had Mayo's name on them. Mm -hmm. And the changes, they no longer have Mayo's name on them. Right. That was the complete, you know, updating it. You just put Hubbard's name on them and get rid of Mayo's name. And apparently having his name on them meant that, the, you know, once we'd achieved the great powers that OT5 confers, we would leave because his name is somehow difficult. But what became evident, he said that what would happen as Hubbard was recovering during an auditing session, they'd be halfway into something and, as I said, earlier in this conversation, Hubbard would say, stop, write this down. And the bulletins were written like that. There were no research subjects, it's like the you know, LSD years after they've come off of LSD. In research into two cases I have found, and one of those cases was Harvey Haber, who told me that 
basically he and this woman had both pissed Hubbard off. And so their folders had gone through to find out what they had in common. They'd both taken LSD. So had Hubbard. Exactly. Hubbard's, Hubbard's case studies were one or two people. <laughs> that yeah. was it. The and thousand most, person I'm goal. telling you, most of his case studies were a case study of one, him. Yeah. You know? or, um, what's his name on the introspection rundown? Oh, uh, God. The Canadian yeah. guy. It was just one person, and he'd solved, <laughs> you know, insanity. Uh, we, yeah, we're not told found the cure for psychosis. Yeah. There will no longer need to be any insane houses. We can empty them all out now because I cured this one guy who we didn't even cure. I mean, it's just, come on. No, the guy left. He, that, yeah, and there's there's no follow-up whatsoever to see what happened to him, but he didn't carry on with Scientology. And it was also it untrue. Was weird, obviously. <laughs> yeah. He left Scientology. He was totally cured. Gone exterior. <laughs> That's right. The Scientology. Oh, dear. But, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Well, okay, I guess, uh, I guess it kind of getting back to the main line of what we were talking about i did we, we we've kind of bounced around a few places here this this discussion yeah and it, i mean it's essentially it's looking at you know as we always do uh, the scientology is an idea of giving you magical powers and right. it That's should right. be looked at in the same way that we look at other fairy stories well, that's it. And, that, and I'm and I'm glad we brought it back down to that, because for a long time, I was under the impression that Scientology was a Gnostic faith, mm -hmm. that it was all about enlightenment and freedom through knowledge alone or through mostly through knowledge, right? Through enlightenment, you would go free. And this, of course, comes from my attitude as a supervisor in Scientology. It's all about the knowledge. You got to get trained. If you're not trained, you're not going to be totally free. So, so the knowledge component is not a small part of Scientology. But what I wasn't paying attention to and the part that, that I even commented on in our podcast on the occult stuff was the spell crafting of Scientology. Right? And that fact, I was, I've always been big on knowledge. I've always been a reader. Of course, that's going to be my bias. I'm going to go in that direction. But I found myself feeling very shifty and uncomfortable when I had to start considering the spell crafting of Scientology, the fact that processes and group processing even and the things that are done to people in Scientology are incantations <laughs> and it's like wow when you really start taking magic words and applying it to what you were previously framing as a semi-scientific process it really starts changing the way you're thinking about this entire topic which is kind of what we were inviting people to do with our occult episode a few weeks ago and more so today you know as we're kind of going a little deep on some of the mystical origins of this stuff but that's the point is there are mystical origins to this material and hubbard was trying to manifest that mysticism into a process in the in the here and now in a technological rational society he's trying to bring mysticism and magic into his personal empowerment and space, uh, like you could say yeah i mean really christian Cherko watched our thing on the occult and um he said there's another point which yeah. that the wording of ritual magic has to be exact you do not ever change a word and that he's absolutely right that goes through you know roman magic all sorts of things and with Scientology, it has to be that. And you also, you have to have that deadpan, that, you know, TR zero, that, that ability to um, intimidate and scare anybody with a thousand mile stare. But right. one of the things that intrigued me when I realized it, and it's a long time ago, was that, yes, of course, you're putting the pre-clear, the person pre-OT receiving Scientology into an altered state. Mm -hmm. You can see that it, mm -hmm. it's happening. Um, we've experienced it. You, you'll get euphoric. You'll get very good indicators. You'll feel great. All of that. So you're going into an altered state. Whether we call that a trans state, I'm not. I don't particularly care. But it's an altered state emotionally. Yep. And therefore, physiologically as well. 
but so ontology differs from other practices if you looked at other forms of hypnotherapy and, and it it is hypnotic in its form then you have the person doing it and the person it's being done to and the one of them is going into an altered state in scientology the auditor is also going into an altered state so you've got two people going into this state and you know the the impossibility the idea that you are going to give 100 percent of your attention to the person across the table from you the pre-clear while also looking at the e-meter word it, voicing the command and writing down what they're saying you're going to give 100 percent of your attention i'm afraid that's not actually happening if you're putting your attention on anything other than that person then something different is happening but you've got two people entering this state and the state may be different you know because one of them is dominant in the relationship um again a typical magical idea doms and subs it plays mm. out throughout magic the electoi and hoi polloi like like you and me um that he's fitting it everything into this system systematic way of approaching things and bringing people into states of mind states of belief um the idea of um you know which yuval and i have both been going on about for years of um the feeling of knowing the feeling of certainty you know which is what gets people pumped into fervor and we see it in religious and political groups and gangs and terrorist groups all around us that we enter fervent states where this is the truth this is the way and if you don't believe me i'm gonna hurt you <laughs> that it it becomes oppositional it becomes this sort of silly childish game where rather than having discussions which are based upon evidence and being willing to question test the evidence through experiment and you're making observations of the world one advances a principle and says this is true and it doesn't matter you know, cognitive dissonance being what it is if you offer me evidence the stronger the evidence is the stronger my belief will become i will resist what you do and it's this perfect trap which which leaves people i mean i did a piece about hubbard as game maker yes uh, and i think that is it's rather important that that he didn't feel he had to follow any of the rules none of this applied to him he could live in a a motor home with stacks of attache cases each with a hundred thousand dollars in just in case he had to leave in the middle of the night uh and go into deeper hiding i i think there is there, there are many clues in scientology you know that, that the word satan is the word satan said with a lisp i think is relevant i think it's he had a a childlike sense of humor and he will often you know when when he told his audience that they'd all spent many lives in arse like us and he'd just come back from england where of course arse lickers is a standard phrase so you're a pack of arse lickers basically uh but there's another one which which is in the word itself scientology and uh, it's a bad construction because the first part of it is Latin and the second is Greek. And you don't do that. Bio, logos, biology, two Greek words put together. Just right. And he then, because he's going, well, skio comes from sienta. Really? How interesting. Because if we go to Greek and we don't try and use the Latin, if we have a Greek prefix and a Greek suffix, skio and logos, Skio is a Greek word. It means shade, spirit, shadow. And it's you know, from the idea that when you die, you leave a shade, a shadow of yourself behind. And so it could be said directly that Scientology is the study of shadows, of things that aren't really there. You are fucking kidding me right now. <laughs> you never told me that. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that was what you needed to know. And it's right here. You got to be kidding me right now with this study of shadows or shades. 
That is hilarious, dude. I am having a, I, my mind is being blown right now. You have just blown my mind. That is, it is your needle floating. It, my needle is floating and I am VGIs. Excellent. That I'd is to indicate. hilarious. Oh my God. <laughs> Nobody's ever, ever said that to me before. That is awesome. I love learning new stuff like that. Um, I needed, I was, oh, damn it. I was going to ask you about something. And then we got onto, the, and you blew my mind. So now my mind is blown. And now I've got it <laughs> in my head. Would you like others to have the losses you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I want others to have the knowledge I now have. <laughs> um, damn it. Yes, the sense of humor there. That is actually, I, I think that there are a number of places where Hubbard alludes to, um, laughing at the audience or being in a position of secret knowledge against his own audience. He talked about how he hypnotized a group of doctors and nurses one time with a shiny tie pin mm -hmm. and how he used it to screw around with and manipulate the audience while he was uh, giving a lecture to them. And he laughingly tells this story to Scientologists, you know, a, 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 ostensibly a year or two after the fact. Maybe true, maybe bullshit. You can never tell with Hubbard. Probably exaggerated. Probably so. And yet the spirit of the intent that is manifest there, let's have a little joke on these people at these people's expense without them ever cluing in on it. And the added bit of, and I'm controlling them without them knowing about it, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, isn't that so funny of me that I can do that? That's a recurring theme in Hubbard. It's not just a one-off in, in one lecture where he, where he mentions that, you know? And it, and it, again, is that manifestation of intent, right? Actions and, and uh, it, it are, are, are far more better um, ways of evaluating a person's intent than the words that they say and Hubbard's actions over the decades definitely point to, you know, an intention to rule over dominate other people. Um, but I but but the hidden little jokes is scattered throughout Scientology. There's just there's just a never ending font of these things. I mean, the the, the skio thing, I've just it's just one more thing. Let me ask you, since I'm thinking about this right now, and I've been asked about this myself and don't know the answer, there's two triangles in Scientology that are important, which is the ARC triangle and the KRC triangle. The Scientology symbol is an S with two triangles interlocked through it. It seems that that symbol was invented before there were there was a KRC triangle. That's a much later writing. I think what's so. Yeah. Up with those, what's up with that S and two triangles, you think? Well, I, I did write a paper. I was trying to think what it what it was because I mentioned the Grave of Fire, the Masonic thing earlier, and that's the symbol for the Religious Technology Center, which is why I said, oh, it might be relevant, that it's uh, like a blue rug with little points of flame coming out of it. And yes. then you have the in finance police and that's a like a red square with a white, and you kind of going, isn't this the Nazi flag? And oh, it looks awfully like that. The S and double triangle. Oh, it's not an S, is it? It's a snake. Right. It's actually drawn so that you've got it, it. It's always stylized so it's a snake, which is a symbol of well, all sorts of things. In the Garden of Eden, it had a certain meaning. Gnosticism uh, again. Yep. Knowledge, truth bearer, yeah. knowledge bearer. The two triangles are the, when you put them back together again, that's the Star of David. Now, anybody that's studied the Kabbalah, whether the, the cult that Madonna's in or, or the, you know, sort of 11th century mystical, magical teaching of, of um, a certain heretical aspect of, um judaism those are that's power those two linked together is it has a magical power it's meant to be very significant and of course with all of this nonsense people have attributed all sorts of things um you know and it it's sort of rather like it, it, because i heard about um it was suggested to me that hubbard had studied magic and it was suggested to me this would be about 1984 not the book of the year, that um, I, I became interested in the idea that 
occult knowledge, Nibs Hubbard put it to me in 84, that the same person who gave the magic to Hitler gave it to his father. That's what he said. And that's what his father had told him. I don't think he was there at the time. Now, so I got very interested in the Nazis and the occult. And I come mm. and go over the years. And, and there is now very good work about it. You okay. used to be like the morning of the magicians or the spear of the Leviathan, which are just nonsense. Mm. Um, you know, the regiment of Tibetans found dead in Berlin. And uh, just silly, silly ideas. But when I talk with historians, a historian about it some time ago in the 90s, and I said, well, why is it that, you know, it would appear that, you know, we, we know that Himmler and uh, Rudolf Hess and a bunch of other, particularly the Bavarian Nazis, they were members of the Tool Society, a ritual magic group related to the Ordo Templi Orientis and the Germanen Orden, or GO, as I like to think of them, that you've, you've got this, this beast wandering around in Germany that, that's all sorts of dreadful um, anti-human ideas will come out of, Aryan race theory being perhaps the worst of them. But these guys really believe this. Why don't historians talk about that? And they don't talk about it because magic's nonsense. And so you're going, so when Winston Churchill got an astrologer to see what Hitler's astrologer was telling him, you don't think that was a good idea? In the same way, you know, when I studied art history as a very young man, I was surprised that you, you, you had art critics talking about what they thought pictures meant, which was fine, you know, or you could go and read what the artists said they meant. You could, you know, with Gauguin, there's so much mythology around Gauguin, you know, the noble savage and all that. It's all nonsense. Um, he was actually a Buddhist. And you won't find that in the textbooks written about him, or you might do now, but you didn't then. I found it by reading what he'd written, Noah Noah, the, the Kaye Poralin and his journals, where he talks about what he believes. And you're going, why didn't this make it into lust for life, you know, or the, this populist view? And, it, and it, I think it's so often the case. And so with understanding that, you know, Himmler did have a round table where he was going to assemble the knights in his schloss, in his castle, it helps us understand the mentality. This becomes relevant with Hubbard because Hubbard believed a set of things which he did not share. Right. And one of those things that he believed, and I, I, I often cite this, is we build a world from broken pieces. That's mm -hmm. a core idea. We're all broken pieces as far as he's concerned. What he doesn't say, and this is a little naughty of me, we build a world from broken pieces, but first we have to break them. Right. And that's what Scientology actually is. It's taking right. people and is vampirically taking away their self-determinism and replacing it with Ron determinism. You know, nice. I, I just had a cognition that Ron was right. You know, it's like, who had a cognition that he was wrong? Put your hands up, you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting because that is necessary from Hubbard's hidden belief set that you just that you just mentioned, right? That that you have to break them because that's the only thing that his power can rely on. Is it's it's kind of vampiric that way. It is. You know, he has to break you and take your power. And that is uh, through your money, through your time, through your life energy, through your influence, you know, through the Sea Org or through the public level. And this is why I try to make the point that that every level of Scientology is experiencing this, whether you're a public person or a Sea Org member. Sea Org members get the brunt of it when it comes to physically damaging and abusive behavior but all scientologists are being broken by the system that hubbard developed it's not make no mistake it's not like you're going to get away scot-free by just going in and doing a little bit of stuff everything you're doing is designed to contribute to this picture of of spiritual breakage you could say you know and that's a hidden covert intent in scientology it's not obvious 
And in fact, most Scientologists would tell me I'm completely full of shit right now and I have no idea what I'm talking about. And I would have been amongst them when I was a Scientologist because it's not, it's so not obvious. It's so hidden that that we're talking about Wizard of Oz, man behind the curtain stuff right now, like stuff that's really deep. You got to dive to get to this level of understanding of where Hubbard was at. But if you really want to understand, well, was he just a con man? Well, kind of, <laughs> but the nature of the con was not just about dollar bills. It was about your soul. Yes. And that's crazy making and crazy, but it happens to be where we're at with Scientology. And th th there is there is an equation that can be made which, which does explain it and, and which I don't think any logic can overcome. And that is, again, a point that, that Nibs Hubbard made, where he said, mm -hmm. so my father's a god maker. That's what he's doing. He's making gods. What does that make him? And that elevation, you know, when he got angry in the early 60s, the idea that anybody had contributed anything to Scientology, you're going, well, hang on a minute. This means that no one will ever be able to understand the truth other than through your perception, because nobody else can discover basic truths of the universe. So right. you are being told from the very beginning, you are subordinate. That's you are right. a slave. You are a piece in, in a game. This is a very, very cynical game. Um, Nibs in the he was with with his father from 1952 to 1959 at which point he said i i've got all these children and i don't you're not giving me enough money and his father said well tough and he was sort of you know savile row shirts and all of this stuff and so nibs left and that's why he left he wasn't upset about it or anything like that but he tells told this story about the congresses they'd have that the way they made money in the 50s was every 6 months they'd have an advanced clinical course and it'd be $500 and they'd get like 30 or 40 people. That's how big Scientology was. You know, the Philadelphia doctorate course, 38 people. Yep. That's all he could get after having sold 150,000 books just uh, a year and a half before. That's right. But there's this, this incident, which one of Nib's kids told me um, where they were having problems with rowdy students at one of the Congress's courses. And so Hubbard turned to Nibs and said, well, work out some way of controlling them. And that's how the upper indoctrination training routines were born. Oh, that's the origin story. I'd heard Nibs had developed those upper indoc tiers, but I never got the origin story on it. Okay. And so the shouting at an ashtray and all of that, the idea is to confuse the heck out of people. So, that, But he also said the Nib's son to me, that um, often as not, Hubbard Senior would turn to him and say, I wonder if we can make them do this. Let's see. And that is part of that magical control. And when you, when that then gets to the, 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 the ships in the Mediterranean and he is throwing people overboard, I mean, from, I'm told, as much as 40 feet high, yeah, you know, the high board in the swimming pool is about 15 feet. Uh, people who couldn't swim, uh, people being yep. blindfolded, roped around the ankles and also thrown into sewage that was being because in Corfu Harbor, the ships were just they'd offload their sewage into the harbor. So right. you've got that's pretty crazy. Putting a four year old in the chain locker, you know, in, in pitch blackness with rats and stinking bilge water, and you know, a four-year-old to get their ethics in he'd started to do more and more extreme things um which again is escalation it's what you expect with psychopaths that that it's no longer satisfying to beat one person to death you have to beat two people to death and you get ted bundy in that terrible final spree where he's in the um sorority house and and he's with a baseball bat um and that I want more, I want more, which is the dissatisfied howl of the demonic personality, the person like Hubbard, where it's not 
I'm not feeling it. I need to do more. And he just kept pushing, looking at Charlie Nairn's wonderful shrinking world of Aaron Hubbard, which anybody watching this should find on YouTube and watch because it's still better than anything I've ever done. I think it's just amazing that 20 minutes where you see Hubbard lying his head off. I have right. no second wife, you know. I had a first wife and a third wife. I have no bank. I have one bank account. Uh, do I believe in reincarnation? Do your followers believe? Oh, yeah, they believe in it. But <laughs> seeing what the Sea Organization crew looked like on that film in 1968, that the elite group of the universe, they're all, oh, don't hit me. So, you know, it, it's through the looking glass. It's the opposite of what it claims to be. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it's it, it's all there if you care to see it. And I guess it just takes some help sometimes. It certainly did. I certainly needed help to un to unwind it, to, to, to see the important bits, to see the things for what they are, not what we were imagining them to be. You know, I'm here, I'm referring, of course, to ex-Scientologists, uh, you know, ex-Sea York members. I mean, we are people who dedicated ourselves emotionally committed in a way that few do to to a cause that we thought was was super important and and we had a level of dedication that matched l ron hubbard's level of dedication we just didn't understand that what he was dedicated to was enslaving us <laughs> if something to persist it must contain a lie exactly exactly yeah. and i mean and, and that you know, the paradoxes, the, the double binds that run throughout Scientology, and, and the most significant one is probably that the purpose of Scientology is to make you self-determined. Once you are self-determined, you can become pan-determined and you can function for the good of all. But that you won't be doing that on the direction of another. And then you look at the, you know, the Sea Org code that you're going to follow and uphold command intention. For the next 1,000 million years, you're going to do as you're told. That's Absolutely. not self-determinism. It's not pan-determinism. And it's Elrin Hubbard had an other intention and a counter-intention that that is, you know, and and I think he just he just kept going, why are these people why are these people following me? Why do they believe me? And you've got the the simple aspect of of conjuring in magic is you wave this hand so they don't look at what the other hand's doing. Exactly. Misdirection. Misdirection. Right. All the That's time. right. Yeah. Let me ask you this real fast, and then maybe we can wrap up. Um, because it occurs to me that as we frame, as we more correctly frame or reposition L. Ron Hubbard in his role and what he was actually trying to do versus what he was saying he was trying to do, we come to David Miscavige, who has taken this whole thing over. Now, Miscavige is not someone that we understand to be deeply indoctrinated into Crowley or mysticism oh, or cool. Gnosticism. He is, he is ill-read, we might say. He, he yeah. left school at 13 to study Scientology, and he's not carried on with the study of Scientology. And I fear that, as with many people who had the study tech enforced on them in their teens, he has real difficulty reading. I found yeah. that with, with many people, I'm afraid, that... Is they don't want to read the book. Isn't it available on audio? <laughs> you know? Right. Yes, there is that. But it'll uh, take you a fifth of the time if you read it. No, I, I'll listen to it. You know, it's okay. Exactly. I have to look up words if I read them. I don't have to do that if I listen. <laughs> okay. So, so it seems to me that we have a we have a man child, right? Who who has psychotic tendencies? Who who ends up? through those tendencies, realizing that power is assumed one fine day. This is Miscavige's big cognition one day is, oh, power is assumed. And from that, I've understood that to mean you take it. Oh, you want power? You take it. You go Just assume exert it. the beingness. You say, I yeah. am the station master and you're all doing, yeah, as it says in the data series. And that, I think is where Miscavige and Hubbard have a meeting of the minds. I think it's that exact point. And I don't know that I or maybe others have 
assign the level of importance to that particular statement from David Miscavige that it maybe deserves is that meeting of the mind with Hubbard, where 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 are they coming at? You know, how are they doing this the same way? What is Miscavige trying to do with this? Well, Miscavige is not all about enslavement for personal spiritual growth or improvement or intent of you know manifestation of his will. No, no. no he's not doing magic. Mm-hmm. I think he is the sort of non-spiritual manifestation of Hubbard in a way. In other words, it's it's all the physical universe awfulness of Miss of 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 Hubbard manifest through Miscavige because that's what Miscavige learned from Hubbard was how to abuse people, how to have them stand on a watch for eight hours outside your door and just and and follow whatever chance order you care to give them in the moment. And they're gonna do it. They're gonna do it. They're not gonna ask you any questions about it. And over the years, over the decades, not being able to manifest or not having that same level of personal charisma or motivational power that Hubbard had, right or wrong, good or bad, he did have it. Miscavige only has force and and non-compliance and punishment drive to enforce his will. Well, I don't know what what's your how do you see this? I I it it seems like an just a, a series of coincidences ran in David Miscavige's favor. Mm-hmm. Um, I, of course, you know, when I left, I was very interested because Miscavige seemed to be the problem, though the reality was by that time, you know, Hubbard was still in charge and Miscavige was very much just a messenger. That's right. Uh, he had no power. But I think that there's an aspect of Scientology which, which I come back to many times, and that is the concept of the only one. That Hubbard put forward. And he is putting it forward in a hostile way. He's not saying it's a good thing. That, mm-hmm. But what I ex- have experienced from many former Scientologists, particularly those who, you know, continue to believe in the tech, is that they believe they're the only one that understands. Now, what Miscavige saw when he was 17 and st- started working at La Quinta on the films is people subservient to Hubbard and the many stories I've gleaned from people who are there the only person who seems not to have not given in to Hubbard was David Miscavige even as a 17 year old he'd say no sir and and fight when I asked Didi Vogadin Diane Vogadin who was chairman of the watchdog committee international and commanding officer of CMO whatever she was the top watchdog the top dog and tremendously helpful in my research. I must say, she's great. And it's a long time ago, but but I said, well, what was he like? And she said, well, he just, if you wanted something doing, he would do it. So if you wanted a wall knocking down, you'd say, knock down the wall, midshipman Miscavige. And he was a midshipman, by the way, that's his highest rank. Um, and he would lower his head and charge. That if it was a matter of, bringing force to bear and making something happen. So he'd seen how Hubbard made all around him cower, the descriptions given in the Clearwater hearings by uh, Adele and Ernie Hartwell, for example, about the treatment. You know, anybody's ill, they they get shoved in this little um, room, basically, in the desert at a temperature of 104 degrees so they can, you know, catch whatever anybody else in there's got. It's just absolutely brutally cruel. Uh, talking with Harvey Haber about his experience there. Just horrible, the way Hubbard treated people. You know, the idea of having a messenger to get the ash from his cigarette and a messenger with the next cigarette ready so that he could chain smoke and a messenger with the chair walking behind him. And he would just sit down. And one day he sat down and the chair wasn't there. And that messenger was put on the rehabilitation project force. So seeing that, that kind of power Miscavige lusted for that. And I That's think, right. you know, he, I think of him as kind of the Brigham Young to Hubbard's Joseph Smith. There's always the one that has to make it work. Hubbard never intended him to succeed. I'm absolutely confident that Pat Broker, who would have been a dreadful choice, <laughs> that 
broker was, you know, Hubbard's fellow alcoholic crony, and he wanted him to take over. I also think that he intended to leave all of the money to Roanne, <clears throat> his granddaughter, through Diana. And in talking about how Diana may or may not have been affected by Scientology, uh, Roanne was seven years old when we were at Toronto, Jesse. Prince talked about going to Diana and getting her to sign a contract, giving her own seven-year-old daughter away. That's right. Whole story there. Yeah. Uh, grim, tragic story, by the way. And this is a woman who has been trained by L. Ron Hubbard. She is the daughter of L. Ron Hubbard. Her whole life she's known L. Ron Hubbard. And this is where it's led her. It's not, yeah. not really worked out all in all. So I think Miscavige, it's his temperament. He's a steroid kid. He's, you know, he has roid rage. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And people gave in to him, but but yeah, I agree with you that that it, he has no philosophical, mystical, magical, religious intent. He just likes <laughs> lording it over other people. Yeah, I think Miscavige is a much simpler beast than Hubbard was. Oh, yeah. I think he's he's about simple down to the level of almost two dimensions. Yeah. Um, you know, and his notion of of the will is, uh, you know, he's going to force himself upon the world. And, you know, hopefully he's going to get his comeuppance soon with the various legal proceedings. And we'll see. But, but I waited for Hubbard to be arrested and and tried and, and it didn't happen you know right i know hubbard hubbard successfully eluded all law enforcement for uh all those years and he died uh you know a recluse and alone and he had thrown every single person in his family under the bus he you know his own wife who had been uh if there was anybody that l ron hubbard owed for scientology it was mary sue hubbard and he just threw her under the bus the second she became inconvenient. Yep. I mean, it's just, it, it's just the, the guy was just, he was just evil through and through. There really isn't any other word for his behavior. Um, but so multi-layered, so much going on there. And then you look at a Miscavige and you just go, oh, he's a thug. Yeah. And that's basically the mentality. And I have spent years going up and down and around analyzing Miscavige's intelligence and and cunning and guile and you know is he is he playing 4d chess here is this is this really this complicated thing that's going on and no man it never works out that way miscavige makes the dumbest decisions on a consistent basis but he's got so much power and so many people willing to fall all over themselves to save him that he manages to keep going for decades. And the only reason why is because people have thrown themselves on their swords to save him. You know, even Marty Rathbun admitting that with destroying evidence when Lisa McPherson's tragic death, which Miscavige was pretty much directly responsible for. So every step along the way, the Hubbards and the Miscavige's are saved by their enablers. And we see Scientology declining be pretty much, I mean, if you really want a reason, one, its destruction is built into itself. And two, because Miscavige doesn't have the wits or cunning or guile to be able to outdo that. He doesn't, he doesn't have that kind of savvy, as, as I see it, at least, you know, and that's why this thing is doomed to fail uh, eventually. Yeah, and there's there's a certain inertia to having two billion dollars in the bank. You know, exactly. like a dinosaur has a very tiny brain, but it's quite dangerous. You know, so you have to cut off its food supply. And I think it's worth saying that that in the simplistic notion of the cycle of action, it doesn't repeat, so it isn't a cycle. I've said this before. Um, misunderstood words that Ron Hubbard had. Dear, dear, dear. But in the cycle of action, we have birth, growth, conservation, decay, and death. The golden age of tech was a statement of conservation. What happens next, David? <laughs> We've hit the conservation point. We're now into the decay. And there will probably be many successors to Scientology because, I mean, in, in the early 90s, a friend of mine sat down and he got this great list of splinter groups from Scientology. And I added a few little things to it here, Ampronistics and Dianology and Idenics and Art Culture and his stuff, uh, 
and thing, then things like Darfrey, John, Est, Eckenkar that, that come pretty directly out of Scientology. We got to 200 groups that we could name, many of them defunct by that time. That was in 1993, 30 years later. It, you know, and, and you'll, they'll just, somebody will grab just one little idea. I remember I bought a book that this guy had written and it was, there were the ethics conditions rewritten. And that was what he, his only one perception of Scientology was that this was the bit that worked. And you go, oh no, you know, really? But. Wow, the ethics conditions, holy shit. Man. Yeah, let's not even think about it. It's just too, oh. too distressing, isn't it? Well, oh. well, I think we've kicked that around a fair amount. Or... I think, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, I, you know, and again, it's really just kind of like, well, what are we looking at here with Scientology? We're looking at nonsense. And we're looking at Hubbard's a unique brand of nonsense. It's just so weird to think that you could start an international, multi-level, billion-dollar valuated corporation that calls itself a religion, all in order to aggrandize the ego of one guy. I mean, you just you, you can't think it could be that stupid and simple. But at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to that. Yeah, and and if we take the the notion of religion out of it, Sigmund Freud did the same thing. You know, no, re no research, no science. Nope. Publish it when you have the thought. Um, no proofs. Why bother? And then if you criticize, I mean, the Freudian community is a lot weaker year by year. But if you stand up and say this, or Jung, you know, we, we've, we've got um, Jordan Peterson out there yes. going on about Jung and you're going but but hang on a minute Jung is 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 fantasy world it it you know there isn't a collective unconscious full of archetypes you know it, it's very amusing but it's not actually true and, and in fact Jung himself as with Freud when you look at them as individuals they're hugely damaged and while it's one thing to say you know to if you looked at Einstein or somebody and his philandering, you know, it's not relevant in any way to the theories of relativity. Um, but if you're talking about somebody who's telling you how to become a perfected human being and they're behaving in a you know anti-human way, then watch out. And exactly. that's the point. It's true of Jung, and it's true in spades of of Elrond Hubbard. Absolutely. Absolutely. This is one of those cases uh, where you can definitely uh, find fault with the founder based on his personal pr proclivities and, <laughs> and problems, because you don't get to talk about how everybody, you know, the ideal state of man and how everybody should act and a moral code for everybody and then proceed to not apply one comma of any of that to your own personal life and yeah. call yourself a guru. It doesn't work that way. No. You know? No, it's awful, awfully bad. Right, well. Um, well. <laughs> we've probably got to get on with the rest of our lives now. Probably, probably <laughs> so. I do want to thank everybody for uh, for sticking with us and listening to us ramble on about all of this. because all it seven is, of you. <laughs> that's right. Because, <laughs> it, you know, again, it's interesting stuff. It's, it's deep dive into, you know, what's the core of this? Well, it's pretty awful. It's pretty hard to look at. It's pretty hard to digest. But it's it's the truth. It's 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 the awful black core at the bottom of Scientology. It's not about our six banks and GPMs. It's about Hubbard's ego mm -hmm. and his willingness to basically do anything in order to achieve immortality for himself and screw everybody else. You mm -hmm. know, and that was kind of how that's kind of how it how it was. And, it, and he left us with the governing policy of of his religion: make money, make more money make others produce so as to make even more money. And I think a religion based on that, you know, it's fair enough. At least that's honest, as long as you understand that that's what you've just been told. Exactly. Exactly. And we were so good when we were in at pretending it was, at seeing it, not pretending, because we weren't pretending, at, at, at seeing it for something different than it was. Yeah, we invested it with with our own um, ethics, with our own desire for the salvation of humanity. Um, when I talked with a Aaron Smith Smith Levin, and he he said to me that you know on the record that that you were different from him because he didn't believe 
And it's like, ah, yeah, if ethics isn't in, Aaron, tech won't go in. That's and right. The, the ethical part of this is we really wanted to clear the planet, and Aaron was a lot more sensible than we were. He realized it wasn't happening. <laughs> exactly. I was way too invested in that whole thing. Me too. Ah, awful stuff. All right, John. Well, thank you for taking the time again. Yeah, always. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah. Always yeah. fun. Great. Always fun. Thanks so All much. All right, folks. Um, and audience out there, please subscribe to both of our channels, of course. Support both of our channels. We uh, are fan-funded for a reason. Uh, you guys are our critics, our best critics out there, and our best fans at the same time. Uh, definitely interested in your feedback on this, what you have to say, what you think about it. And uh, I will see you guys next week. Yes. We will see you on the other side of the bridge. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> bye bye. Hi, John here. Thanks for watching. We'd appreciate it very much if you would click like, as well as subscribe, and click the bell for notifications. Every dollar helps, and we welcome new patrons on Patreon. We can make a one off payment with any currency through PayPal. Thanks so much. You blew my mind, so now my mind is blown, and now I've got it in my head. <laughs> Would you like others to have the losses you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I